welcome uh, everyone, or as we uh, are, uh, say here in Texas A&M, howdy. howdy. We are delighted to welcome you here. Uh, this is a, a tremendous opportunity uh, of which the Scowcroft Institute provides us many uh, to spend time listening to great uh, world leaders uh, have an opportunity to uh, to discuss and consider the great uh, events uh, of the day, uh, as well as uh, the historical perspective on that great event. So we're delighted to have you here uh, today. Uh, this institute does bring leading figures from around the world uh, who help us understand uh, these events. Over the last few months alone, we've heard from leaders of international stature in public policy, government, uh, academics. These insights and perspectives really do shed new light on our understanding, the way we think about ourselves, uh, the way we think about the world uh, in which we live. So today we have a very special uh, opportunity uh, to welcome a man who has served as a major political f leader, uh, dedicated public servant, uh, the former Prime Minister of the United Kingdom and leader of Great Britain's Conservative Party, the Right Honorable Sir John Major. Uh, he will be introduced uh, a little more formally by our uh, wonderful Consul General who is with us, but I have asked to take the liberty of, of, of just expressing a, a few thoughts about this great man. Um, uh, I am a great admirer. Uh, grew up in South London uh, from humble beginnings, but uh, soon uh, his passion for politics became evident, became a member of the Young Conservatives, Still in his 20s, he was elected uh, to the Lambeth London Borough Council, launching a career in public service that would define the entire rest of his life. Uh, in 1990, when uh, uh, Margaret Thatcher stepped down from office, uh, he followed in her footsteps, of course. Uh, in her memori memoirs, uh, Prime Minister Thatcher expresses uh, wonderment about the future of Great Britain and what would happen after her departure, but she wrote, and I quote, my problem was the lack of a successor whom I could trust to keep my legacy secure and to build on it. I liked John Major and thought he genuinely shared my approach. Now for Margaret Thatcher, that's extraordinary praise. Uh, she went on to write, no other candidate found greater favor with me. And certainly he proved that throughout his tenure tested by uh, challenges of the academic climate at the time, uh, but uh, his uh, grasp of uh, the economy, his grasp of, uh, of, of the political situation uh, did s set him apart, a gifted negotiator. Uh, his conservative colleagues had called him uh, the ablest mind of his political generation, the last authentic conservative prime minister and one of the most decent people to lead the country and party for years. I think that's a wonderful tribute and a and a and, and true in every sense of the world. Um, he, he, he accomplished a number of things, bringing the IRA to the negotiating table and engaging them in a dialogue to in a conflict that had been uh, ongoing for decades, setting the stage for the Good Friday Agreement in 1998. Uh, during the early 90s, he was also known for his close connection to President George H.W. Bush in whose library we sit today, and uh, who you all know is so revered on our campus. He strengthened that special relationship between our two countries, uh, ensuring that uh, in the Gulf War we were joined together uh, in what was an extraordinary enterprise. When President Bush passed away nearly a year ago, tributes from around the world were led by Sir John, who said in his interview, he was admired with such affection, he was admired for what he was as well as what he did. Today, we're very fortunate to welcome him uh, here to the university that President Bush loved so much. Now, to make the official introduction, uh, having, uh, having expressed my tremendous enthusiasm for today's speaker, uh, I'm delighted to introduce the British Consul General in Houston, Mr. Richard Hyde, who has been here uh, just about a year now, I think. A few months, okay, a little less than a year so far. He's a career diplomat, uh, served a wide range of diplomatic and con commercial positions around the world, including in Costa Rica, uh, India, Armenia, Saudi Arabia. Uh, he became, uh, began his position as uh, Her Majesty's Consul General in Houston in June of 2019 responsible for leading all of the United Kingdom's engagement to not only in Texas, but in Oklahoma, Arkansas, Louisiana, uh, and New Mexico. 
uh, we are delighted uh, to have his uh, uh, service and his presence here with us today. So let me introduce uh, Mr. Richard Hyde. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Now, I'm, I'm not going to speak for too long because there's very little I can add to what is already a very warm uh, welcome to our guest of honour. And of course, you didn't come here to listen to me. Um, I just want to share a, a personal uh, a memoir almost, which is very rare for diplomats to be able to do this about, uh, about former ministers and prime ministers. So I, I joined the Foreign Service about, f about four to five weeks before John Major became the British Foreign Secretary. So he was my first real boss. I mean, he was at the top and I was at the very bottom, but I still feel we had a connection. Uh, very shortly afterwards, uh, very shortly afterwards, he moved to be the Chancellor of the Exchequer, so the man who held the purse strings of government, and then the top job, Prime Minister. Um, and that was a pretty rapid rise. It was very turbulent times. Um, we had issues over Europe. We had issues with, uh, with the Middle East very shortly afterwards. We had a big enemy in Russia, as the French would say, plus ça change. Um, but we, uh, very soon thereafterwards, um, I, I moved to Bermuda. My first diplomatic posting as a very nervous young uh, diplomat. And uh, the Prime Minister decided to have a summit with President George Bush in Bermuda um, in about a month after I arrived. And uh, this was a daunting uh, task for me because I was the one who had to do all the work in the background. Um, so I wasn't invited to any of the great events in that, in that visit. I, I was just the guy who pushed things up, up and down hills. Um, but I happened to meet the Prime Minister. He came along to get his classified um, briefings uh, from, from, from my office. And uh, he, he said to me, are you, are you going to the reception? And I said, what reception? He said, oh, you must come. So I, I went along and my boss, I told my boss, the prime minister told me I must come, so I must come. And not only did I, not only did I go along and have a, have a, have a very, very good time, um, I also got the opportunity to actually shake hands and meet with President Bush. That's my only connection to President Bush, and it was exclusively down to the generosity and kindness of a prime minister. That is not always the words you will hear from a diplomat when talking about their head of state. Generosity, <laughs> kindness, humility, humanity, they're not words that we tend to use after they've left office, but in this case, <laughs> um, I am very privileged to say that I can say them and I mean them. He, he goes down in the annals of the Foreign Service and in the annals of, of British politics as somebody we remember very fondly because he was all of those things. And um, I'm not allowed to talk about any politics at the moment because we are in the middle of an election in the UK, so I am banned from being political. But I'm just going to say that um, I miss those days. <laughs> Sir John Major. For many years, I've wondered who the interloper was at that particular. <laughs> if you wait long enough, all things are revealed. <laughs> well, hi, everyone, or as I think they say in the vernacular, howdy. Howdy. It's a great pleasure to be here. Always a great pleasure for me, of course, to be in America because my father was brought up in Philadelphia in the 1880s when my grandfather was uh, helping to build the Carnegie Steelworks. Now, the mathematic, uh, mathematicians among you may notice that's quite a long time ago. Uh, when I was born, my father was 65, and my mother was surprised. <laughs> <laughs> now, it is a special pleasure to be at Texas A&M, and I'm grateful for, to the university, the Bush School of Government, and the Scowcroft Institute for the opportunity to be here. And it was very easy to accept the invitation, because George and Barbara Bush were very close friends for a very long time, and so was Brent Scowcroft, one of the most uh, delightful men you could ever meet. And of all the politicians I know, George Bush, with that innate decency and civility, was the leader who looked into the future with the shrewdest eyes and the greatest concern for what and who would follow him. Now, George Bush was an internationalist, a true citizen of the world. And he would, I believe, be concerned by much of what he sees today, as am I. And so, in part in homage to George, here in his uh, final place of rest, I'd like to set out some of those concerns before we turn to the important part of this, uh, this meeting, uh, your questions just a little later. 
Now, for years, for the whole life of most of the people in this room, we've been bound by the liberal-based international order, which was built on the agreement of the San Francisco Opera House in the 1940s to establish the United Nations Charter. And the overall purpose of the whole liberal order, not just the Charter, was to establish rules-based organizations to monitor and channel international behavior after the utter chaos of the Second World War. It was led by the United States, and it was visionary. But many of those organizations have now lost or are in the process of losing the authority that once they had. They're seen as out of date and in need of reform. And some are also facing attack from populism and from growing nationalism in many parts of the world. Certainly, if I may take the United Nations, the United Nations is out of date, has five permanent members on the Security Council, each of which has a single nation veto upon policy. And those members, America, Russia, China, France, United Kingdom, may have well been the dominant countries in the world in 1945, but 74 years on, it's unrealistic to argue that all of them remain the dominant countries. Nations such as Japan, Germany, India are growing powers that believe they too should have permanent status on the Security Council. And they have a strong case, both in terms of their population and their growing uh, international uh, resonance. And whereas our world evolves in an extremely complex and often rather dangerous way is any representation from uh, Africa or from the Middle East. So far, that too is missing. Yet if the UN is to perform its function, and in particular, I quote, to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war, and one looks at Syria or Yemen to see precisely how vital that is, then it needs the authority to act, the authority that carries with it the support and encouragement of every part of the United Nations, because it cannot be legitimate unless it carries that authority. Now, one welcome and obvious advance would be to enlarge the number of permanent members and abolish the single nation veto that can so often make a mockery of what the UN seeks to do. Take Russia, uh, for example, under President Putin. Russia has been creating mischief in Eastern Europe, mischief in the Middle East. And yet she can veto, as a mem permanent member of the Security Council, any United Nations policy designed to rein her in. That is in no one's interest except Russia. And none of the permanent five, sadly, none of the permanent five is arguing for a reform that would limit their own influence. And unless such a reform is demanded by ideally the United States, or at least another member of the permanent five, I can't see it happening. But for the sake of future world order, it certainly should happen. And then of course, there's the World Trade Organization not established in the 1940s, not established, in fact, until 1995. Yet already, only 20-odd years into its life, it faces impotence as member states undermine it, including, in this case, the United States and China. Now, America, to take them first, were always wary of the concept of a trade body for sound economic reasons. In the 1940s, attempts to form an international trade organization failed being beaten back by opposition in Congress. And today, President Trump refuses to approve the appointment of judges to serve on the dispute resolution panel as their predecessors become statute barred from their length of service. And yet, that appellate body is the cornerstone of the dispute resolution system. In a month's time, only one judge will remain in post and unless President Trump's policy changes, the adjudication of trade disputes will cease entirely. Now, at a time when America and China are engaged in a trade dispute that's adversely affecting not just their countries, but many third countries as well, it's disappointing to see an internationally agreed resolution system suddenly fall out of use. But that is the Alice in Wonderland world in which we're currently living. And that is but one of many uh, examples one could give. Now, we are right 
to worry about this trade dispute. If trade is disrupted, no one wins. Forget talks of winners, there will be none. The US National Bureau of Economic Research warns us, as do similar bodies in the United Kingdom and Europe, that the risk of protectionism is greater now than at any time since 1945. And they estimate last year an astonishing statistic this, that new tariffs in America have cost the American consumer and firms a simply astounding $688 billion in the last year alone. But there's a bigger point here. The fact that America the world's predominant economic nation state by a country mile now has higher tariffs than any other competitor and that raises the risk of other countries feeling that they too can return to protectionism. Because where America goes, others will follow. China and America are in dispute and as global supply chains are interrupted, Japan, Singapore, Hong Kong and many others suffer from falls in exports. And it's not just the Far East. It's true too of Europe, notably Germany, with her export-oriented economy and her motor manufacturing outlets in the United States. And China is complicit, at least as complicit as the United States. When China joined the World Trade Organization, it was expected she would conform to international rules. She has not conformed to international rules. She's widely believed to appropriate other countries' intellectual property, their technology transfer, as well as favoring and subsidizing her own, usually state-run industries as well. And China's defense that she behaves properly is unconvincing and hard to credit. But her behavior does illustrate the importance of America because China goes out of her way to excuse her own actions by pointing out that over the last 30 years, America has imposed three times as many non-tariff protections as China. Now in the spirit of America first, and although it's called differently China first too, both countries tend to oppose multilateral trade deals. And I think the reason for that is that being so economically powerful, in bilateral deals they're able to dominate the terms because they are disproportionately larger than anyone they would partner with. Despite that, elsewhere, multilateral deals are still being made. The European Union, a far from perfect body, but 28 member states, have reached trade deals with Japan, Brazil, and the Mercosur countries of Latin America. And in Africa, often forgotten Africa, a continent-wide free trade area has been agreed to bring together 1.3 billion people in a $3.4 trillion economic zone. The IMF say that this could be a game changer, an economic game changer for all Africa. But as yet, in our world of relentlessly negative news sensations, this quite extraordinary and positive development has gone largely unreported and largely unnoticed. Now, the international order faces other challenges as well, more vivid ones in many ways. One challenge is to the authority of governments and the concept of democracy itself. Now, many people thought that the advance of democracy, and by that I mean Western-style democracy, one man, one vote, was unstoppable. They were wrong. Democracy has been in mild retreat around the world for quite a few years. The United Nations reports show that 89 countries, 89, 89 countries have seen a reduction in democracy and human rights, while only one third of that number have seen improvements. There is also more widespread antipathy to government than I have ever known in all my political life. The 2008 financial crash led to a disregard for conventional Western democracy as the growth of living standards faltered after decades in which year on year they had improved and had been expected to improve by every person living in that country. Let me give you a startling figure. It comes from the United Kingdom to illustrate the point, but it is startlingly similar in the United States as well. 
in every decade since the 1930s, the majority of ordinary, everyday workers, men and women alike, had an increase of about 20% in their net disposable income at the end of each decade compared to their position at the beginning of that decade. A remarkable increase, decade after decade after decade. Since 2008, the improvement is not 20%, it's tiny, it's 1%. And the beneficiaries are mainly restricted to the higher paid or the elderly in retirement who have had their social benefits increased above the rate of inflation. So it isn't surprising that between those two extremes of the elderly retired and the very high income earners, that the majority of people feel government has failed them even though it was the action by government and central banks that almost certainly prevented a systemic collapse in our financial system and ruin for millions. But this perceived government failure <coughs> runs alongside and has probably done a great deal to fuel the growth in populism and the acceptance of populist governments often led by so-called strong men. Now, I have no regard whatsoever for populism. Typically, the populist makes promises that can't be met, thrives on creating division, magnifies discontent, undermines the judiciary and the rule of law, attacks the structure of government, condones violent opinions, penalizes minorities, condemns unpopular views, and bypasses longer established and legitimate authority. Populism is popular only until it fails, as it always does. And it does because it is founded on dishonesty and self-interest and fueled by exploiting grievance, exercising malice and encouraging dissent. But at a time of disillusion, populism is fertile soil, very fertile soil, because the populists promise to deliver hope and hope is the most potent of battle cries to people who have none and are beginning to despair. That promise, of course, is never kept. But that only becomes clear when they've been elected to govern and their failure becomes apparent. And by that time, a great deal of damage has been done. One only has to look around the world to ask oneself, are we moving towards an era of illiberal democracy? President Putin attacks democracy. President Xi ignores democracy. President Erdogan abuses democracy. Its unquestioned primacy can no longer be taken for granted. And consider, for example, the policies of Mr. Orban in Hungary, Mr. Duterte in the Philippines, Mr. Maduro in Venezuela, Mr. Ortega in Nicaragua. One could easily add to that list. And so the question arises, does policy in these countries enhance democracy, freedom, or human rights? And my answer to that is no, it does not. The reverse is true. In order to accumulate power, they undermine opposition and independent organizations. They violate existing practice. They dismember familiar rights. They ignore checks and balances, and they weaken the judiciary. Whatever else this may be, it is not liberal democracy. It is not democracy in any form that I recognize and acknowledge. And we could also look with similar concern at volatile leaders in, for example, Brazil or Guatemala or across almost all of the Middle East. None is delivering mature democracy or stable or contented societies. Now that raises a question, an important question. Why are such leaders and such regimes supported at all? And putting aside false support in corrupt elections, which occurs in some places, it may be because some autocratic nations, most spectacularly because of its size, China, achieve high growth without democracy. And to those people living in dire poverty or in stagnant economies, that is an attractive proposition. If you worry about putting clothes on your back or food in your belly, then you are more concerned about that than the right to vote in an election. So it's easy to understand the choices that people make, but important to reject 
that concept of autocracy. History warns us with vivid clarity that absolute power has been misused too often to be complacent about seeing it happen again. China illustrates the risk, not now, but potentially. For over 30 years, her double-digit growth benefited the whole of Asia. Millions, millions upon millions in China and beyond China were lifted from poverty. Her GDP now matches America and Europe, though not, of course, her GDP per head. To combat the impact of the financial crisis, China launched a massive investment program, twice the size of America's stimulus itself, very large. It was bold, it was confident, it was magnificent, but it was intensely risky. And so as China then necessarily took action to halve her deficit, debt soared and growth slumped. Even as the economy rebalanced, internal problems arose in China. When car sales fell, it was domestic Chinese models that no longer sold, which cost many manufacturing jobs. At the same time, Chinese advances in technology destroyed white-collar jobs. The risk of social and political unrest began to increase. Now, such a situation is uniquely risky to China because the ruling Communist Party has no electoral legitimacy. It's no longer uh, a, a, a theological legitimacy. It's no longer communist. Its sole legitimacy is improving the quality of life for its 1.4 billion people. And if the Communist Party were to fail badly in that, then it could fall as well as fail. Chinese leaders have not forgotten the fate of their neighbors, the Soviet Union. And this fear also explains China's refusal to extend electoral democracy to Hong Kong, despite their implicit, not explicit, but implicit promise that they would do so. Because for a governing party in China that no longer has a communist ideology, democracy could be the virus that kills, and Chinese leaders understand that very well. To the autocrat, democracy is dangerous because it threatens their power. But the democrat, autocracy is the enemy of liberty of mind and action. China isn't alone, but since she is the most powerful autocracy, I use her as an illustration. But please do not think she is one and only in that position. Now, I don't believe for a moment at this time that China is an aggressive military power, unless provoked. But I do note that her military capability is growing as she prepares to protect what she regards as her own. In 1995, China had only three submarines. She now has 60, with plans to expand to 80. Last year, incredibly, China had more warships and submarines in service than the United States, and by a clear plurality, 370, 317 to 283. In the last decade alone, China has built 100 warships and submarines. She's flexing her muscles and becoming more than an economic rival. George Bush, once ambassador to China, would have understood that very well indeed. Now why does the international order matter? It matters for this reason. It matters because a purely nationalist policy of self, self, self is profoundly unattractive. Might isn't always right. It isn't even sensible. More importantly, the politics of self-interest betrays the future. Because we face problems for the next generation and the generation after that that cannot be solved by nation states alone, however rich or powerful they may be. Climate change is an obvious example. We meet today, as we meet today, the Arctic is warming twice as fast as the rest of the planet. There are fires above ground in hundreds of thousands of acres from eastern Siberia to Alaska to Greenland. The Amazon is shrinking. Since the 1970s, nearly one-fifth of Brazil's Amazon has been destroyed by development. To put that in context, it's an area 
much bigger than France. Deforestation slowed in the early years of this century. But in 2018 alone, Brazil lost one billion trees. One billion trees. The oceans cover 70% of the Earth's surface. Sea levels are rising. Can we ignore this? No, we can't. Can any one nation overcome this alone? Of course it can't. No again. So the international order does matter. Cooperation does matter. If later this century low-lying islands, perhaps Singapore, perhaps others, sank below the waves like a modern Atlantis and did so because others polluted while they waited for the world to agree on climate action, then how would the world forgive itself? We need to work together. We need rules for fair trade, for common standards, for collective action against threats, whether those threats be rogue nations or war or pandemics or economic collapse or global warming. None of those are capable of solution by one nation state acting on its own. We need cooperation. We need international rules and standards. In our global world, without common standards, we will retreat behind national borders an international cooperation so vital to our future will diminish. The 16th century English poet John Donne once wrote, No man is an island, nor today, 400 years later, however powerful it may be, is any one country. In our search for future peace and well-being, we stand or we fall together. Now, within this maxim, America, with her unique and remarkable self-sufficiency in so many areas, is the nearest thing to an exception. When America speaks, the whole world listens. When America sets an example, others will follow. When America acts, the world reacts. In economic crises, the world buys US dollars, not euros, not rubles, not renminbi. It is impossible, and I sometimes think America does not understand this herself, but it is impossible to overstate the power and influence potentially in the hands of the United States. And dependent upon how that power is exercised, she is either admired and respected or feared and distrusted. What America does or does not do shapes our world for good or for ill. Now, we are going through a challenging and turbulent period in our history. No, there is no great international war, but there's discontent in government and minor wars in many parts of the world and huge numbers of people believing that they are falling further and further behind with the enormous likelihood of future social disruption if that continues. And so as much as we have done at any time in peacetime, we need a nation, a leading nation, to bring our world together, to update the post-war ambition of unity, to promote and right, fight for the free market and the rights of free peoples to democratic control, to be that city on a hill that Ronald Reagan talked about, to be those thousand points of light that George Bush aimed for, and to be the nation that would pay any price and never fear to negotiate as set out in that most famous of all modern inaugural addresses by President Kennedy. Now you may think I ask too much of your nation, but Presidents Kennedy, Reagan, and most especially George H.W. Bush would not have thought so. No other nation, not China, not Russia, not even the 28 nations, soon to be 27 sadly when Britain leaves, not even the 27 nations of United Europe can do what America can do for this generation and for the next. The burden is heavy, but it must be borne. And if it's borne, it may even secure a future that right now may seem unattainable to many people in many parts of the world. All my adult life, I have seen your great country, first among equals because of its power and its size and its leadership, lead the Western world towards greater security and prosperity and freedom. 
That isn't a job for one president or one presidency. It's a job for many. From my perspective of years, as a wartime, world wartime baby, from my perspective of years, I know that time moves more swiftly than we believe and that the past governs the future more profoundly than we imagine. All around the world, it is the younger generation, those soon to leave education, that will govern. And they will inherit that mantle of government with many problems still to be overcome. And the success of that generation will determine the way of life for the next generation and generations yet to come. The point that I am making is this. Government is not for others, it's for you. And how that government is conducted here in the United States will have an effect on the lives of millions of people far beyond your own shores. Now you here at the Bush School of Government and Public Service and the Scowcroft Institute of International Affairs could not have two more internationally respected names behind you as you embark on your future life, whatever that may turn out to be. The first, one of the greatest public servants of all time, to my view. And the second, not only a distinguished and much decorated general, and one of the finest foreign policy minds I ever worked with, but also another profoundly wise and good man. Two great internationalists whose first instinct was always to employ America's soft power to maximum effect. Only when America was provoked beyond endurance or pride would the world be reminded of her supreme and unmatched military might. Restraint is the most tangible display of power. During these rather challenging and turbulent times in our common history, on both sides of the Atlantic, it is a good moment to reflect on how effective a restrained, dignified and tolerant government can be. And when that style of government is enacted by the world's most powerful nation, it sets a benchmark for others to follow. Here, at Texas A&M, having been tutored in the creed of George Bush and Brent Scowcroft, you are going to be as equipped as anyone, equipped as anyone can be to ensure that your own benchmark is set as high as theirs, in my experience, always was. And in that, and in the interest of the wider world, I wish you every possible success. Thank you very much. <clears throat> now we come to the interesting bit. This is where you get your own back. Um, I'm prepared to do a deal with you. You can ask almost any question you like, almost any way you like, and I will answer it any way I wish. <laughs> can you wait for the microphone to come? If you don't mind me adding to the introduction that was made, um, what you made a huge impact on me in my early years, my early adulthood, that is, because you probably are the only prime minister of the United Kingdom who did not have a formal university education. You rose from a working class background, um, made it to the head of the Conservative Party, and became prime minister. I don't think that has been repeated in our contemporary times, I believe. And that, for me, was a huge um, acknowledgement of your intellectual caliber, certainly, but also your integrity. Um, in your early career, you worked in my native country, Nigeria, as a bank clerk. Now, one thing that bothers me, though, today is I'm an immigrant. Um, and I'm an American now, proudly so, and I can relate to how Americans, I get this with my um, in-laws, my family, because they're American, native-born Americans, don't quite appreciate the influence America has on the rest of the world. Mm. 
But besides international order and its present state, as you have elaborated on, I wonder whether a more insidious danger, if you might say a more insidious enemy, might not be the absence today, sadly, of, say, truth, decency, the presence of dissimulation in our political space, um, might not be a more formidable opponent, a more formidable red stop sign that we should be more wary of. And I'd like your thoughts on that. Well, thank you for your kind uh, words. I did work in Nigeria. I was in Nigeria doing the Biafran War, if you remember it very well. Um, I worked for a bank there, and um, a number of our staff were killed or injured, and they asked for volunteers. And as I was eminently disposable, I was <laughs> rapidly chosen and sent out. And I was actually the manager of a tiny little branch that had four people in it. The four people were, were, were myself, the Ghanaian accountant who knew what he was doing, uh, the, the, the teller, and the boy who swept out the bank. It was a magnificent branch. <laughs> and I thoroughly enjoyed it. And I fell in love with Africa. If any of you have never been to Africa, go there. It has the highest skies in the world. And it is going to change. If I were a young man again, and I wanted to go and make my fortune, I would go to Africa. Because Africa is going to change beyond belief in the next 30 or 40 years. Where the rest of the world are building houses, Africa will be building cities and it is going to be the most extraordinary change. And you may be one of those handful of people that don't like Africa, but most people who go there, it's a very easy place to fall in love with. Absolutely magnificent. And uh, I remember Nigeria with very great affection, despite the fact that after a car accident, I left bits of myself behind there. <laughs> um, you're right. The way in which politics is conducted is important. It can enliven, it can uh, abuse, it can poison the public atmosphere if it is conducted in the wrong way. If it is conducted without respect, it can poison the atmosphere. And it's very easily done. And there's a combination of events that are bringing that about in a number of countries, a number of democratic countries that I'm too modest to name. And it is very dangerous. And a lot depends on people who care about their country deciding that they are going to put up with the vicissitudes of politics and actually enter it. If it's in your blood, don't be put off. If you think you can contribute, don't be put off. But don't go into politics unless you know what it is you wish to achieve. You can always judge a politician by one test. Can you look at that politician and say there is one thing that will persuade him or her to resign because they cannot bear it. If you can find someone who would resign over something, then support them, because they have a conscience and the ability to discriminate between what is right and what is convenient. And that is the great gift that George, George Bush had, in, in my view. But I think you are absolutely right. The importance of truth and decency is very important. But you may spread it more widely. We're in the middle of a general election in the United Kingdom at the moment. And some of the things that I read in the media, read or hear, I know are patently untrue. And yet they are widely disseminated. Now, whether that is a poor quality of journalism in its wider aspects, or whether they are being fed this nonsense by participants in the election, is not something I can be clear about. But I notice it does poison the atmosphere, and it does damage. And so does the internet in its various ways, where it is, it could be used for good, and in many ways at the moment it is not. So if the nation is governed by people who are truthful, civil to one another, and decent, then I think that democracy is likely to thrive if they are not, if they are governed by people whose interests are personal, not national, or even in some cases national, not international then I think the likelihood of that country thriving is correspondingly diminished. So I entirely agree with the whole thrust of your question. And I wish more people said it. Yep, where do we go? Just here. So we heard you talk about um, your opinion on foreign relations between the United States and China. About? Uh, United States and China. Yes. What is your... Um, view or your policies view on Vladimir Putin's government in Russia? Um, 
I am not an admirer of Mr. Putin. Um, you can take a man out of the KGB, but you can't take the KGB out of a man. And he is uh, determined to twist the nose of Uncle Sam. He daren't confront America uh, full frontally, as it were. Perhaps I might have expressed that more delicately. <laughs> he, can't, he can't bluntly oppose the United States because the United States would eat him alive. It's much bigger and more powerful. Today's Russia is not the old Soviet Union and nothing like it in terms of power. But he can be mischievous. He is being mischievous with what he's been doing with Ukraine. He is being mischievous with what he threats in East, threatens in Eastern Europe. He is being mischievous in what he has done in Syria. And it is very important, I think we have learned that in the past, that he is confronted before he thinks this arrogant behavior can be carried further. And that does mean that we need a strong NATO. And that is <coughs> an issue that needs to be confronted. America is the leader of NATO. America has reason to resent the fact that some of the European nations do not pay enough as, they sh as much as they should into the NATO pot. When successive American presidents say that, they are absolutely right. They, some of the Europeans do not. And they need to be pressured into doing so. But we should not let go of NATO. It may be that we need to renegotiate the NATO treaty. Does Article 5, the famous article that if one NATO member is attacked, all will come to their aid, does that truly apply with the extension of NATO? Can we be certain that is how events would fall out if a NATO member were attacked? I'd like to know the answer to that, which is why I think an updated NATO treaty would be a very good idea. And in the Middle East, I would make this plea to your country. Don't turn your back on the Middle East. If America turns its back on the Middle East, there will be a chaotic situation made much more likely in the absence of a benevolent, genuinely democratic power. Whenever America creates a vacancy, either China or Russia will march in to fill it as speedily as they can. And so Russia is not a danger in the sense that it was when I was your age, when you, and, and a bit after, <laughs> when you had nuclear missiles pointed between America and Russia that could have devastated the world had they ever been used. We're not in that situation now. But Russia is a potential mischief and does need containing. Uh, yes, where were we? Yes, over there. And, th and then the young lady in front of you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Brad Morith. I'm a PhD student here. Uh, my focus area is uh, the road to Maastricht, German unification, the end of the Cold War, uh, very intrigued by your talk today. Um, I was wondering if you could talk about your role leading up to Maastricht circa 1991 uh, with Kohl, uh, German Chancellor Helmut Kohl, uh, Francois Mitterrand. Um, thinking about that time with uh, liberal trade agreements, the Uruguay Round and such, uh, and, and the, the birth of the EU, um, how, how does, what, what do you see from that time, lessons from that time uh, that lead to the problems that we have today. You have several hours? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I would love to listen. Let me, let me take a few minutes. Let me first say something which I have never found understood much outside Europe. And that's why the European Union was formed in the first place, because it is relevant to how it hangs together in difficult times. After the uh, last war, <coughs> all of Europe was bankrupt. And much of Europe was devastated. Uh, the Marshall Act, America's uh, Marshall Act to Europe, was one of the most remarkable acts in history to bring Europe back from near economic death to become a living entity. But those early Europeans after the war looked around the world, and what did they see? They saw the power of the United States across the Atlantic. They foresaw the power of the big populous nations of the world, China, India, Japan. And they knew that if they remained as individual nation states, none of them at that time with a population above 60 million, then they would be pygmies in a world of giants. And so they decided that for political and economic safety, they had to band together. They started with the iron, coal and steel community, then the old common market, <coughs> and then it morphed towards the European Union and moved a lot way forward 
with the Maastricht uh, Treaty. So that is how it all began. And what does the European Union achieve? Well, it's, it's very easy to criticize the European Union as being bureaucratic, because it is much too bureaucratic uh, and inefficient, and sometimes it is. But when the European Union, when the Europe began to come together, Spain, uh, Italy, uh, and uh, Portugal were fascist dictatorships. They're now modern democracies. The free market was small. There's now a free market that's actually, in total, slightly bigger than the United States in Europe. It has changed the whole way of life and the whole prospects for all of Europe, which is why, despite its shortcomings and its need for reform, and it does have shortcomings and it is in need for reform, the continental Europeans are so keen on keeping the European Union together. Uh, when it came to the Maastricht Treaty, we British, in one sense, were the odd man out. And we were the odd man out for a couple of reasons, three reasons, really. Um, I was Prime Minister at the time. They were heading towards a single currency. I was not ready to move to a single currency and destroy sterling. And the reason for that was I didn't think a single currency would work until you had a proper functioning market in which each country within the European Union was able to compete fairly within the same currency zone. The chance that Belgium or Luxembourg could compete fairly with Germany was farcical. The chance that Spain, so newly out of fascism, could compete with it was, was absurd. And so I was strongly opposed, not to the concept of a single currency, but to imposing a single currency before we had got the market working in a way that was possible for it to be fair. And so I opted out. Indeed, I threatened to block the Maastricht Treaty uh, unless Britain was given an opt-out from the single currency. And something else they called the social chapter. The social chapter sounds very cosy. It wasn't cosy at all. It was a job-destroying instrument. Um, and I wasn't prepared to engage in that. The third point, which came a little later but was aired at Maastricht, was free movement across Europe. I have nothing at all against free movement across Europe. I think I'm not anti-immigration at all. I think it refreshes parts others can't reach. How Britain would manage without migration, I don't know. But they made a fatal mistake. They said within the whole of Europe, people can move. But they did nothing about the external border. And of course, just across the sea from Spain, you have the whole of a turbulent, potentially violent series of countries in the Middle East and beyond that Africa. Quite apart from any other consideration, we could not survive utterly unrestrained migration from there. So for those three reasons, I opted out of parts of the Maastricht Treaty. But I did agree with its thrust. I did agree that if the world was going to be dominated as it has come to be dominated by America and by China, then Europe needed to be there at that top table to preserve European interests. With great respect to your great democracy, I didn't want all the rules in the world made by America and made by China with us lamely following on behind when the cradle of world democracy actually lie within Europe. And so I do want Europe to be strong, and I did want Europe to be strong, and I still do. My country, for reasons of English nationalism, basically, have decided to opt out of the European Union. I think it is the worst and most dismal foreign policy decision that has been made by the United Kingdom in the last 200 years. Many people seem to think it's very good and Europe, England is going to be <coughs> free to do what she wishes. Well, we will be free. We'll be free to be poorer. We'll be free to be less influential. We'll be free to be more hidebound and more insular. We'll be free with all that. But we aren't going to be materially better off. We aren't going to be militarily better off. We aren't going to be better off in terms of our international influence or any of those things. And we've weakened Europe as well in doing so. So I am utterly, utterly opposed. You may have gathered this. I'm utterly <laughs> opposed to this concept of uh, the UK leaving the uh, European Union. It is bad for our present and bad for our future. And I very much regret it. But there is one very good thing. And that is a young generation under 25 if opinion polls are correct, and there's only the usual 5% divergence from truth, 
something over 80% of them wish to remain part of the European Union. So we may lose now, but I have great hope that many of your confrères in the UK in 20 years' time will take us back in to uh, where we, we should never have left. Uh, coal and Mitron both wanted a single currency in Europe. They both wanted a euro, but they wanted it for different reasons. <laughs> Helmut Kohl wanted it because he looked at Germany's past and he said, I never want Germany to cause trouble in Europe again. Let me sink Germany into a common endeavour, being the single currency. And Francois Mitterrand said, no, not to Helmut Kohl, but to me, let us have a single cur currency. It will bind Gulliver down. And by Gulliver, of course, he meant Germany. But Mitterrand was assuming, um, in that uniquely French way he had, that uh, the government of the new currency would be by the foreign ministers meeting in enclave with France having a voice. He didn't quite realize, I think, he was not a technician, that uh, it would mean a European central bank and uh, that it would be an independent central bank run by bankers, largely along German lines. But for those quite disparate reasons, they both came together to demand a single currency. It was the right policy, wrong timing. And then to actually implement that policy in 1999 was a fundamental mistake. And the reason so many people have been unemployed across southern Europe is because they cannot compete with northern Europe in the same currency area. Sorry, that's just a dipstick sample. <laughs> yes, where were we? Yes, young lady in front. Oh, right. Um, we're from the Aggie Cricket Club, and uh, we're passionate about the sport. And... I know you've been the president of the Surrey Cricket Club, the honorary vice president. Can you tell us a little bit about your inspiration for the sport? How did you pick it up? What made you interested in the sport? <laughs> well, my sister taught me. Um, when I was born, both my parents were very old and soon very sick. And so to a certain extent, my elder sister, who was uh, 13 years older than me, no, she wasn't, she was 15 years older than me, uh, brought me up and from the age of three she started teaching me to play cricket. I think the reason she was teaching me to play cricket was that she was able to take me to see the local cricket team every weekend and there were some extremely nice young men in the cricket team. <laughs> uh, but nonetheless she taught me to play cricket and taught me to love the game and it, it came fairly naturally to me and I did. And I have never regretted. I know you have this obsession with another game. <laughs> but the Aggies are going to change your mind, I hope. It's an extremely good start. It is a superb game, cricket. It's played as much with the mind as it is with the body. And it is, it is a lifetime study to understand all the intricacies of cricket. But it is a game with the most remarkable characters and the most uh, remarkable stories uh, from the history of cricket. It was probably first placed in, played in England in the middle of the 16th century by peasants. It was a game in that unusual combination you get that was played by peasants and by the gentry but never by the middle classes. You'll find in Europe it's always the same. Uh, the, the, uh, the peasantry or the modern version of the peasantry and the modern version of the upper classes are always faster to move to something new than the middle classes who always take some time to get used to it before they finally decide it's a good idea and follow on behind. But I, I wish you well in your cricket. I gather from talking to you earlier, you have a dozen or so other teams you can play. And anybody here under the age of 80 should take up the game immediately. <laughs> we were thinking if um, you could help us organize a cricket match between the Surrey Cricket Club and the Aggie Cricket Club. Whenever you come down next, that would be, that'd be really cool. <laughs> I hope they're a good team. They're pretty, <laughs> they're pretty good. Surrey, the Surrey Cricket Club is 150 years old. Uh, the players, fortunately, are a touch younger. Um, but it's 150 years old. Uh, it was originally a market garden uh, where they played. It's turned into one of the most magnificent stadiums anywhere in the world now. I'll, I'll mention it to you. <laughs> yes, We've also got a, uh, a gift for you, if I could present it to oh. you. It's a cricket bat. Oh, lovely. <laughs> well, thank you very much indeed. 
Thank you. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. It's a handy weapon. <laughs> I could have used it in cabinet. <laughs> How are we for time? There's a young lady just here who's been. We have one more gift. Maybe ah. we weren't told about this. Have we got one more question? Because this young lady's oh, been waiting a long time. Is that possible? Yes. Okay, thank you. This Very may be a mistake. Okay. One thing I've learned in politics is there's always one question too many. <laughs> um, sorry. Um, I was wondering, you've spoken about the pace of development in Africa, the Middle East, and across the world. How do you think that China's Belt and Road Initiative will impact this and the spread of democracy? Well, I'm not sure it's going to do much to spread democracy. Uh, the, Belt, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative is an extraordinary complex uh, and uh, ambitious idea to open up the old Silk Roads. Um, but the belief that China is paying for it is misconceived. It's actually being predominantly paid for either by private investors or by the in individual countries through whom the Belt and Road uh, will pass. And I'm not sure it's going to do a great deal for democracy. It may do something for trade but it is at the moment running into a little bit of difficulty. But the idea of developing those parts of the world and letting the intermingling, peacemaking effect of greater trade take root is a very good idea. So I hope it manages to succeed. But I wouldn't hold my breath waiting for democracy to follow in its wake. I'm not sure it will.